Well, this morning we're looking at uh, Colossians chapter 2. Um, as I was preparing this particular sermon, uh, it, it did get to be a rather significant, um, uh, let's say a rather significant amount of uh, things so that um, the emphasis, I want you to understand as we begin this morning, as I read this text, the emphasis is going to be on verse 8, and it's going to be on the enemy and how he works and why he does what he does and so forth. And we are going to look at the solution a bit at the end, but very briefly at the end. Of course, the solution is Jesus and trusting him and trusting his word. And that is in our text, and I want us to, as I read the text, particularly focus on, on that you know, there is warfare going on, but we need to know how to overcome the enemy, and we can only do it by holding fast to our captain, the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to read from uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, to the end of the chapter, but pay particular attention to verse 8, because that is the warning that Paul is issuing to the Colossians, and it's just as relevant to us today as it was to them in their day. So this is what Paul writes beginning in verse 6 of chapter 2. He says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete, and He is the head over all rule and authority. And in Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath uh, day, things which are a mere shadow of, which, of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God." If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. I'm going to stop the reading of the word there, and I hope you understand what Paul is saying here, is that there's these different systems that are basically teaching you that this is how you can come to God, this is the way you should come, and this is the way you should live, but he's saying that these ways aren't going to lead you to God, they're going to lead you astray. These things are not going to help you overcome your flesh. They're, they're, they have no value. We need to listen to what the Lord um, says. So he says, see to it that no one takes you captive uh, to these ideas, to these systems that ultimately the enemy has inspired. So do not let the world deceive you. And again, just so you'll understand the way that I'm working through this, he is talking about world, you know, systems that are in the world. But 
I would suggest to you, the one who is behind them and who is inspiring them is the devil. Okay, so this is spiritual warfare, though it is carried on with the ideas of men. Well, let me begin by saying this. Last week we saw that the Lord wants us to grow up. He wants us to mature. Uh, John spoke in our text uh, of three levels of growth that are within the body of Christ. He said there are spiritual infants, which are those who have trusted Jesus, have been born into his kingdom, experienced God's forgiveness, know him as their father, know their future is secure. And, you know, many churches, that's all they emphasize. That's kind of where it stops. Let's just rejoice in that. Let's just worship the Lord. Let's just have a great time. But the Lord wants us to move on. He wants us to grow. John also spoke about young adults, those who have moved beyond infancy, those who have become strong in the Word, who know what the Word of God says, who have gained experience in using that word skillfully, and who, by His grace, have applied it to overcome the evil one. And again, that's very pertinent to what we're looking at today because he's talking about they're engaging the enemy. They're fighting the spiritual war, the one that we're all actually in, even the spiritual infants, only they're being protected by God, so they're not as aware of it as we are, but we are supposed to be growing up and engaging the enemy. And then he talked about those who were older and wiser adults who have not only experienced what the first two groups have experienced, but have gone beyond them to know the Father and the Son in an even more intimate way, who have reached the point where they're willing to do what the Apostle Paul talks about in his own testimony in Philippians chapter 3, willing to do whatever they must in order to experience more of the Lord's power in their lives, even if it means they must suffer, who actually want to suffer for His sake so that they might know Him. Now, the Lord wants us to mature. He wants us to grow from one level to the next. And He wants us to grow up so that we can fight, so that we can fight His battles. I mean, this is one of the main reasons the Lord saved us. It wasn't to put us on the gospel train, which leads to heaven merely. But that's, again, somehow so, the way some Christians conceive of the Christian life is it's basically a ride. It's, it's a ride one takes. You get on the, the you know, the, the, you say the train of Christ, which, which stops in heaven, and you ride that train all the way, and that's all you do. But that isn't all we do. We are actually called to fight in a battle that has been ongoing from the Garden of Eden forward and will continue until the Lord returns. Now, it's because of this that historically uh, the church have under, has understood that there are two aspects to the church as a whole, two ways in which it can be viewed. And, and I think you're familiar with these terms. The first is the church militant, the church conceived of and in its warfare. As those the Lord has conscripted by His grace into His ranks in order to fight this war. A war which we know, first of all, is against ourselves, against our sins, so that we will want to fight for Jesus' kingdom and His glory. Instead of just living for ourselves, we will live for Him. Which is secondly against the world, against uh, the enemy as He works in the world, against the ideas that the enemy has planted in the minds of the world, which is why we've read what we did at the beginning Paul says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ because there is a lot of ideas out there, a lot of thoughts which are contrary to his will. And a battle which is against the devil himself as well as against his army of fallen angels since he is the one working behind the scenes to hold the world captive. It's also working more directly as well. Now, this is the war that we are called to fight, that we might be used by him to save the souls of his sheep who are yet to be delivered from the enemy's kingdom and to train them and to send them out also or to send them into the battle so that they too may fight. So that's one way that we view the church as the church militant. But it can also be viewed from another perspective. I, I should say it's not so much a different perspective, but it's a different locale as the church triumphant from the perspective of those who are in heaven, who 
who have fought the good fight and have overcome by his grace and entered into their rest and who are now enjoying the blessings which the Lord has promised for those who do overcome. But of course the point is we, we do need to fight and we do need to overcome. If we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now in the church militant. We are the ones that he has enlisted to fight this war in, in our generation. And that's why he calls us to grow so that we will see the warfare. We will see that we are in the war, that we might train for that war so that we'll be able to fight successfully. Not only not become casualties of the war, but help rescue other people from, again, the kingdom of the evil one. Now, this morning, I do want us to consider that our enemy has a weapon, and his main weapon is deception, and that's the main one he uses against us. Uh, that's because that's the way the devil is. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, verse 4, when he was speaking, of course, to those who were in the kingdom of darkness, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. The reason why Jesus said that is because they wanted to kill him. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Notice that Jesus says he doesn't stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. He speaks only lies. And he is a very good liar. As a matter of fact, he's the first liar. He is the father of all lies. He is the author of deceit. And more often than not, he is able to use his deception very well, not only to keep people from coming to Jesus, but having come to him to keep them from growing and engaging in the fight that is against him. You see, if he can neutralize us, he can preserve his kingdom, the kingdom the Lord tells us that we are to overcome. Now, in our text, first of all, we see Paul warning his audience, but I want to draw your attention to who this audience, uh, whom, well, who they actually are. The church, okay? The church at Colossae, the Colossians. He was warning believers. Now, I point this out just simply to say this, that even though we have come to Jesus, we are still liable to be misled. Satan is able to trick us. He is able to deceive us. He is able to tempt us to get off the path that we should be on. Now that shouldn't surprise us because we have many examples in Scripture of him doing this very thing. Satan used Bathsheba to tempt David to get off the path. And not only did David fall into adultery, but he also murdered. He murdered Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, in order to cover up his sin. Uh, he tempted David on one occasion to count the men in his army. That's what it means when David went out and he issued the command to have the, uh, you know, the armies of Israel numbered. And what was wrong with that? Well, God wanted David not to trust in his numbers. He wanted David to trust him, to guard and protect Israel. But by numbering the people, he was trusting his army, putting his reliance upon them rather than God. He tempted Peter, as you know, to deny that he even knew the Lord Jesus Christ in order to save his own life. Now, Satan is very persuasive. He is so persuasive that he was even able to get, in a way that, that's hard to fathom, a perfect man and a perfect woman to disobey God and to eat from the forbidden fruit. If anybody should have known better, it was them, but he was even able to deceive them. Now, thankfully, though Satan can deceive us, if we belong to Jesus, he cannot, he cannot destroy us. Jesus gives us eternal life, and no one is able to take us from his hand because no one can take us from the Father's hand. Satan cannot destroy us, but his deception can cost us. It can cost us dearly. Adam and Eve listened to him, and what happened? They died. 
Physical death was sown in their bodies. They may have lived to be nearly a thousand years old, but that's a drop in the bucket still compared to how long time goes on. They died, but along with them, all of their children died. For his adultery and murder, David lost his first child with Bathsheba and three of his other sons, and his kingdom was divided. Many people actually died because of that sin. For putting his trust in his army, he had to face three days of a plague that killed 70,000 Israelites. Now, Peter's denial inflicted a wound on his soul that remained with him for the rest of his life. He was still writing about it at, at the end of his life. Sin always comes with a price, okay? At the very least, it's going to cost us some of the very, some of the precious, I say, the precious little time that we have to serve the Lord, some of our opportunities to reach others with the gospel, uh, some of our credibility in the eyes of others if they see us sinning, and some of the rewards that we might otherwise have gained. But of course, it can cost us a great deal more, as you've already seen from these examples. So we need to be aware that the enemy is out there, and he is working to tempt us. Now, the second question is, how does he do it? Well, what he does is he tries to confuse us, okay? He tries to confuse what is right with what is wrong. He tries us to get, well, he tries us to, view, to get us to view God's truth as the lie and his lie as the truth. He's trying to turn things around. He is the one who reverses everything. We talk about how God is a God of reversals, how sin brings discipline, sin, sin brings judgment. Sin can turn a paradise into a wasteland. And when God comes, his blessing reverses the curse and turns the wasteland back into a paradise. But what is it that turned it into the wasteland in the first place? It was Satan and his deceptions and those who fell into it and then had to experience God's reaction, as it were, to it, his judgment of it. He is the one who takes the blessing and turns it around into a curse, and he does it through deception. Now, sometimes he works directly. No sooner did God tell Adam and Eve, you can eat from all the trees of the garden, but don't eat of this particular tree, that Satan came to attack that very command and to call it into question. Uh, we read in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 4, Satan's coming to, to Eve, Indeed, has God said, did he really say this? You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And of course, he didn't say that. The woman said to the serpent from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. She got that right. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. If we just extract that one comment out of there, God said, you will die if you eat from this. Satan says, you won't die if you eat from this. He turns what God says completely around and he tries to make the evil that they shouldn't do to appear good. Thomas Brooks actually has a, a very good book about this called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And he points out what a great fisherman Satan is. He knows just how to bait his hooks when he goes after us. He knows us very well. He knows our weaknesses, but it's always a deception. There may be a golden bait on there that looks wonderful, but there's a hook inside, and he's going to get you on that hook if you go after it. So he tries to turn that around. Now, did David not know that it was a sin to take another man's wife? Did he not know that it was a sin to murder and that both of these crimes actually warranted capital punishment? He knew that. But Satan convinced him through this temptation that those few minutes of pleasure that he would have with Bathsheba were worth whatever the cost might be. The deception. David knew that he should trust God to protect his army. God had told him not to number his army, but to trust in him. But the devil convinced him it was to his advantage to do it. We read in 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1. This was what was behind that numbering of Israel. Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Now, it's interesting. A parallel passage in the book of Kings tells us that God is the one 
who did this. And he did it through Satan. And we ask the question, why did 70,000 people die on account of David's sin? The reason is because God was punishing Israel and he used David to do it, but ultimately used the enemy to deceive David to do it because Israel deserved judgment, okay? So it's not that 70,000 innocent people died because of David's sin. They were guilty, and God was bringing this occasion to bring that judgment on them. But why were they guilty? It's because they had listened to the devil, and they were doing things they shouldn't have been doing. They weren't listening to God. Now, Peter knew what disowning Jesus would cost. Jesus said earlier to his disciples in Matthew 10, 32 through 33, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Peter knew that Jesus had said that. And Jesus even warned Peter in advance that the enemy was coming for him. He says in Luke 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, Simon Peter, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And you know what? God gave him that permission. Now, Jesus does go on to say, but I prayed for you. And when you turn again, strengthen the brethren. But you see, even having been warned ahead of time in two different ways, the devil still succeeded in getting Peter to listen to him and to commit this sin. Now that's why Peter later warns us in, in his letter that we are to be on our guard against the evil one because he prowls about like a lion seeking someone to devour. Well, he was prowling that night and he found somebody to devour and Peter had to feel the sting of his bite. And again, as I mentioned before, there were consequences. So he can come directly, but he can also come indirectly by means of those who belong to him. And that's what Paul is actually addressing in our text. The world, as we know, is largely under the control of the evil one, which is why Jesus calls him on numerous occasions the ruler of this world. Do you know that when the devil came to Jesus when he was being tempted in the wilderness and offered him the kingdoms of the world, and he said, they've been handed over to me, and I can give them to whomever I want. And he was talking there not about the territory, but he was talking about the people. They were under his control. Do you know that Jesus did not dispute that claim or question his right to do it? He just simply repelled him because he knew that he had come to inherit those kingdoms, but he was going to do it through his life and his death. But he didn't question. Satan had that authority because it was handed over to him in the garden. And even though Jesus at this point in, in redemptive history had bound Satan by, by his coming into the world through his earthly ministry. He's bound the strong man that he might plunder his house. Now, he isn't bound absolutely, but he is bound that he might not deceive the nation while Jesus plunders his house through the gospel. Even though he is bound in that sense, it's clear from Scripture that he still exerts a great deal of influence over the majority of the human race. You know, Paul writing after Jesus finished work, which he's doing in Colossians, but also in Ephesians, still calls the enemy in Ephesians 2.2, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Even though he is bound, he is still at work. He's still at work in a majority of the human race. So Paul is warning the Colossians in our passage because they live in the world that is populated by people who are deceived by the evil one. And he's warning them that they not be affected by his deception. He writes in chapter 2, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. He's still at work. You need to be on your guard. Now, again, he's at work in the world today. Nothing has changed. His strategies also haven't changed. We need to be on our guard. That's why Paul's writing this. Now, when Paul says, when he writes this, see to it, he's literally using a word that means beware. And I think beware is a stronger word, and I think we should understand that and take it to heart. 
Beware means to be aware. Be always watchful. There's something dangerous out there, and you need to know it's there, and you need to be watching for it. Well, what is it that we are to be watching for? He says, watch or be on your guard or beware that you don't be, become captive, that you don't, you're not taken captive through philosophy. Now, this being taken captive means to be brainwashed, to be led astray, to be taken control of. And in this case, by the world's philosophy, by the empty deception which is inspired by the devil. The word philosophy literally means the love of wisdom. I think we, we know that by now. But every time it's used in Scripture, it's used negatively. In the New Testament, to refer to any human system of understanding of knowledge that opposes God's truth. Systems that can deceive us into thinking that this is the truth rather than what God says is the truth that can make us think that we finally grasped or understood the reality behind everything we see. We understand origins. We understand where we came from. We understand ethics. But we understand it apart from the Word of God. It makes us think we have it, but our hands are really empty. All we've grabbed onto is foolishness. Now, Paul mentions a few of these systems here that he was dealing with in those days. And scholars disagree, you know, exactly what he was talking about here because it seems like a strange mixture of things. Maybe it wasn't one school of thought. Maybe it was a, a few schools of thought. But each of them, he is warning them against because it undermines God's truth. Now, in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, he appears to be speaking against the Judaizers. He says, let no, he says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, remember, the Judaizers believed that Jesus was not enough. Trusting Jesus, following Jesus, that won't get you to heaven. You need to be circumcised. You need to keep the law of Moses. You need to keep the dietary laws, you know, food and drink. You've got to be careful what you eat. You need to keep the feasts, the festival, the new moon, or the Sabbaths that are connected to those feasts. You need to keep the traditions in order to be saved. Now, it's true that Paul tells us in the Bible that the Jews were free to keep their traditions as long as they kept them at the level of a tradition and didn't add it to the work of Christ. But that's what the Judaizers are doing. When you add it to your salvation as the basis of your justification, as we know very well as we've been following Sinclair Ferguson on, on Wednesday evenings, it amounts to legalism. Justification being declared righteous by God, by Jesus Christ, plus the things that I do. And when you do that, you destroy the gospel. Now, it was affecting the Colossians. It was also affecting the church of Galatia. And let me just read Galatians 2, verse, or 5, verses 2 through 6. And just for you to bear in mind as well that this is a warning against adding anything to the gospel. Paul writes, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. So essentially what Paul is saying is this, don't be captivated by this philosophy of the Judaizers, the traditions of men who tell you that you need Christ plus something else. If you listen to that, if you're captivated by that, you will be destroyed. You need to hold fast to Jesus and Jesus alone. Now he appears to be addressing a sort of pre Gnostic idea in chapter 2 of Colossians, verses 20 through 23, and we've talked about them recently, but he says this, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, 
as if you were living in the world, you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. I mean, what's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about asceticism, okay? The idea that I deny my, my body certain pleasures, even certain necessities, so that I can overcome my sins. Now, remember, Gnosticism taught that all matter was evil, but only the spirit was good, and we are spirit and matter. Now, that movement went in two different directions. Epicureanism said that since the body was evil, anyway, it doesn't matter what we do with it, let's eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Stoicism believed that too, but, but the, since the body is evil, it should be denied so that the spirit could grow stronger. Now, that view crept into the church as asceticism. That's why we have monasteries, you know, in, in the history of the church and uh, why they denied themselves so many different things. The belief was that by denying their body, they would grow in holiness. But as a matter of fact, we know it doesn't work. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us it doesn't work. It may look very religious, but it has no value in defeating your flesh. Now, what was even more dangerous was how they applied this belief to Jesus because if it's true that all matter is evil, Jesus could not have been righteous and yet been a real man who was made of matter. He only seemed like he was a man. And John tells us that if we believe that, that Jesus did not really take on our nature. We don't have the Holy Spirit and we are not saved if we do not believe that Jesus was fully man. He writes in 1 John 4 verses 2 and 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus has come in the flesh is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Now John is telling us that the Spirit of God, if he is within us, would not bear witness to a lie like this. And further, if Jesus did not become one with us, if he did not become a human being and part of the race of Adam, he could not have taken our place in our obedience and on the cross for us. We could not be saved if Jesus did not become a part of the human race. I told you that Satan's lies can, count, it can cost us a great deal if we listen to him. Well, if we listen to his lie regarding Jesus and, and the idea of matter and so forth being evil, we will not be saved. So the devil has his costly counterfeits. And virtually for everything that God says is true, God tells us in his word that he exists. What does the devil tell us? The devil says God doesn't exist. That's what atheism is all about. Or if he does exist, we can't know that he exists. You know, I believe that's the position of Stephen Hawking, who recently passed away. He says, you know, I believe that we can explain the creation, or not the creation, but the existence of all things apart from God. He says God may exist, but we really can't know that he exists. But he doesn't have to exist because we know how the universe came about without God. Well, you know what, Stephen Hawking, he knows that God exists now, and he knows that God created all things but it's too late once you die. You have to face God as your judge. You have to trust Jesus while you're alive. So if we believe that lie of the devil, we will never come to know the God who exists, who is known through his son Jesus and may only be approached through Jesus, and so we will perish if we listen to that lie. Uh, God tells us that he made mankind. The devil tells us that mankind is an accident. It's basically evolutionary, came about by natural processes. God doesn't even need to be in the picture. Again, Stephen, thinks Stephen Hawking. He wasn't created, he just happened. But again, if we believe this, we won't accept the fact that we're sinners under God's judgment, and so we will not come to Jesus because we won't believe in a God, we won't believe in sin, we won't believe in a fall, we won't believe in the consequences of the fall. 
God tells us in his word that there's a right way and a wrong way. The devil says whatever the majority believes or accepts is fine. You know, the idea of pragmatism. You know, whatever works in society, that's fine. God tells us to be sexually pure. The devil says free sex. We should be free to live the way we want to live because God doesn't exist anyway, and if he did, he would approve of this. God tells us to be faithful to our spouses. The devil tells us to be faithless. If you're not enjoying the one you're with, go find somebody else. God tells us that marriage is between one man and one woman. The devil says it can be between two men and a woman, or one man and two women, or between two men or two women. Again, subverting what God has established. God tells us, as we read in Romans chapter 1, that homosexuality is a sinful choice. It's not something we're born with. It's, it's a choice people make, and God's going to hold us accountable for all of our choices. You know, if we make sinful choices, and that is a sinful choice, well, the devil says, God made you this way. It's fine, and he approves of it. And there are even churches that, that may be made up of those practicing homosexuality. And they think it's fine and that God loves them and they're going to accept, he's going to accept them. But that's a lie. And if they believe that, they're going to perish. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus says. God tells us that we should accept and submit to authority. The devil says, resist authority, question authority. God tells us that there is salvation only in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil tells us every religion leads to God. It doesn't matter which one you believe. It's all the same God. You're all going to get there. Now, God, his truth leads us to salvation. But the devil's lies will lead us to hell. That's why Paul warns us not to be taken captive. Don't get brainwashed by the world's or the devil's wisdom, but rather, he says, be taken captive by Christ because he is God in our nature. He is the one sent by the Father to tell us the truth. He alone has done what is necessary to save us. We need to trust him to justify us. We need to trust him to lead us in the right way. And so let's be encouraged by this exhortation by Paul to grow in the Lord Jesus, to trust Him if we don't know Him for our salvation, but to grow in our understanding, to be grounded in His Word, to gain, you know, to be strong in the Word of God and in its application to the point where we can see through the lies of the enemy, not be taken captive by His wisdom, but rather see through that and engage Him with the truth, with God's Word and Spirit, not only for our well-being, but that we might also be able to help others find Him. Now again, this evening, as I mentioned before, this is just setting the context for what we're going to see this evening. This evening we're going to look at the current system that Satan is using, the current philosophy that he's using to cloud the minds of unbelievers, postmodernism, which believes we've done it all wrong, so we need to take it all apart now and try to create a new reality with our ideas. And in doing so, it, it basically takes the meaning out of everything, and you can basically, you know, create your own meaning. And that's what we see people doing. You know, you want to be that gender? That's fine. You can do that. You want to say that that evil thing is right? You can do that. That's your opinion. Your opinion's valid, as valid as anybody else's opinion. So anyway, that's what we're going to be looking at this evening, and we're also going to be looking at how to deal with this philosophy. But let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer now and let's ask the Lord to help us become aware of the fact that the enemy is at work and that the world is largely influenced by him and ask that the Lord would help us to escape any brainwashing that we've experienced and do what it is that the Lord calls us to do in his word.